History writing as answerable style. O quam te memorem. Virgil, the Aeneid. Passaftli me memorem. Joyce, Finnegan's Wake. One. The style of the historian and the style of art. All men desire knowledge, but not the knowledge explosion. Knowledge may always have had a mortal taste, yet it used to contain the promise of a better position in the scale of being, and a surer sense of one's true or effective identity. But what if earth becomes an earth of ideas? The sea a metaphor for the multiplication of facts and sensations? What can soul desire, sitting unhappily on superstructures of explanation? Poor bird, not knowing which way to fly. The ease with which earth, sea and bird become symbolic counters is part of the problem. Their lapsed value is felt, if only in passing. Marvell's image of the soul gliding into the boughs, waving in its plumes the various light while it waits to be released from earthliness, is appropriate as a counter-reminiscence. That image has a reserve of resonances which the mind can explore at leisure, while as a whole it evokes that very restraint of ecstasy which makes leisure possible. It does not matter, of course, that such images are, or seem to be, from nature. What matters is the quality of our association with them, the decorum of use. It is a great pity that people should, by associating themselves with the finest things, spoil them, Keats complains. Lee, Hunt, has damned Hampstead and masks and sonnets and Italian tales. Hunt's fault is at once moral and aesthetic. Instead of giving other minds credit for the same degree of perception as he himself possesses, he begins an explanation in such a curious manner that our taste and self-love is offended continually. Keats's sensitivity to palpable design, to the knowing or self-assertive mind, is only as significant as his understanding of the morality of art. The figures on his Grecian urn resist the explainer ravisher. The poet's crescendoing questions see stanza one, are like the ecstasy they project onto the mute dancers. Their very intensity of speculation seems to animate the urn until its mystery is in danger of being dissolved, its form broken for the sake of a message. We behold, as in a primal scene, the ravishments of truth, the identifying and over-identifying mind. The poem itself, however, by various finely graded stages, part of art's ritual coldness, tempers an intellectual questioning not unlike love madness. As the eye cannot choose but see, the soul cannot but desire truths, and art engages this lust for knowing or merging. To conceptualize art's relation to it is difficult. Aristotle's poetics evolve the key notions of recognition and catharsis, but even interpretations not clarified by precise concepts can do much to illumine the decorum of art by the intelligence of their despair. It is no ultimate objection to an interpretation that it merges partly with its object, too much the syllables of art itself, or lets artifacts like Keats's urn tease and evade our meditation. Yet what of histories of art? While not excluded from studying the reserve of a work of art, the style of its resistance to ideas, they remain histories, and a function of the historical consciousness. Beyond describing the form of art, they seek to link it to the quality of the artist's historical awareness. Walter Benjamin, for example, connects the disappearance of the art of storytelling to our psychological and urban restlessness. There is nothing that commends a story to memory more effectively than that chaste compactness which precludes psychological analysis. And the more natural the process by which the storyteller forgoes psychological shading, the greater becomes the story's claim to a place in the memory of the listener. The more completely is it integrated into his own experience. 
This process of assimilation, which takes place in depth, requires a state of relaxation becoming ever more rare. If sleep is the apogee of physical relaxation, boredom is the apogee of mental relaxation. Boredom is the dream bird that hatches the egg of experience. A rustling in the leaves drives him away. His nesting places, the activities intimately associated with boredom, are already extinct in the cities and are declining in the country as well. With this, the gift of listening is lost and the community of listeners disappears. It is lost because there is no more weaving and spinning to go on while they are being listened to. The more self-forgetful the listener is, the more deeply is what he listens to impressed upon his memory. When the rhythm of a work has seized him, he listens to the tales in such a way that the gift of retelling then comes to him all by itself. Eric Auerbach undertakes a fuller analysis of this kind in the opening chapter of Mimesis, where two influential narrative styles of the Book of Genesis and the Odyssey are radically distinguished by the charm they exert on the communal listener, or conversely by the limits of their interpretability. Such an approach leads historically from the mythical way of storytelling to its difficulty in Wordsworth or Henry James, even to the difficulty of history writing itself, which has reduced the role of fabulation in favour of psychological or sociological shading. Yet, in modern art at least, the new non-fabulous reserve is forged, so that Eliot remarks of James's mind that it was too fine to be violated by ideas. Critics are right to worry about the proper relation of ideas, explanations, truths, beliefs, to art. The problem has outrun Wordsworth, Keats, or James. The very word idea has now become problematic. It embraces things with very different status, organizing ideas or models, and truths imperatively held. It is one thing to say that certain beliefs or their symbols, pagan gods, for example, are essential to literature another that they are true. This difference is being eroded by the historical consciousness. We live in an era of convergence, where all truths, outmoded or not, seem to enjoy a formal value. The growth of the historical consciousness, its multiplying of disparate models, all of which press their claim, amounts to a peculiarly modern burden, an overhead weighing on the individual like a new theology. To be aware of the past is to be surrounded by abstract potentialities, imperatives that cannot all be heeded, options exhausting the power of choice. One need not be a historian to suffer this state of tsunami. A liberation not of men and women, but of images, has created a theatrum mundi, in which the distance between past and present, culture and culture, truth and superstition, is suspended by a quasi-divine synchronism. A living cinema surrounds us, a Plato's cave full of coloured shadows. If art is to retain a certain purity, that cunning stroke, as Emerson called it, which separates out the precise symbol or the one adequate form, it must triumph over this synchronic pressure of abstract knowledge. But the crisis is not solved by bringing, once again, order out of variety, and discovering new forms. There are too many forms already. They now debouch into life directly, without the special mediation of masterworks. Our hearts are sad at the culture supermarket. Packaged historical reminiscences meet us everywhere. The Beatles' yellow submarine is a moving toy shop of topoi. Purity in art? It is no longer achieved by new forms, but rather by new media that allow existing forms to survive the contamination of meaning, of historical or ideological accretions. In the Renaissance, the translation of classical riches into the new medium of the vernacular must have been a purification of this kind, making things new and concrete at the same time. And within the vernacular itself, the pastoral mode was not so much a new form as the creation of a new reserve, evoking the silence and slow time of a fading Latinity. Today we translate into the language of the cinema. Frames speak by sheer juxtaposition, montage, or generally by the disassociation and then remixing of images and their meanings. 
It is far, yet not so far, from Keats's pictorialism in the Ode on the Grecian Urn. The way each frame in the turned object repeats a questionable shape or mysterious defilade, a mute picture dubbed by the poet. And the purification of contaminated images in Wallace Stevens, or the scenarios of Robbe It is far, yet not so far, from the obsessively detailed inspections of one spot in Wordsworth's The Thorn, to the narrative retour of the same, itemized scene in A Nouveau Roman. One difference, of course, is that images have now to survive explicitly sexual or vulgar attributions, but whether the mensonge semantique is of a noble or vulgar kind seems less important than that structured negation by which images reject meanings they save in the end. The image is always anathematic, in David Jones's sense, always a lady of silences, torn and most whole. Hartmann then quotes a passage in French from Robcouillet's preface to La Mortelle, which I will translate into English. The young woman will sometimes freeze, like a wax statue in the Crévin Museum, or like a goddess, a conventional prostitute, even an erotic photo in the most traditional, most naive style. The same applies to the city. All contaminated in the mind of man by a mixture of Pierre Lotti, Guy Bleu, and the Thousand and One Nights. It will constantly pass from the Taurus postcard to the displayed symbolism of chains and iron gates, but without ceasing for that to be full of the living noise of boats, ports, crowds. Can history writing, or interpretation in touch with it, become a new medium, a supreme fiction which does not reduce being to meaning, but defines a thing sharply in the difficulty of what it is to be? We have stressed only the moral obstacle, Wrong hypotheses may spoil the finest things by their kind of slander. But the present situation takes us beyond questions of decorum into an ontological perplexity. The hypothesis-making mood we are in, with its variorum of perspectives or superstructures of explanation, threatens artifacts in a peculiar way. It endows them with a false reserve created by the very pressure of interpretations brought to bear. As interpretability becomes more important than historicity, and the praise relinquished for the shadow, art objects seem to split into, on the one hand, a uh, Gegenstand, the artifact as indeterminable, mere obstance of the interpreting mind, and on the other, a prehensile corpus of explanations incited by art's ipseity. The very openness of symbols to several even opposed kinds of meaning, assures their impregnable reserve in the midst of explanatory assaults. This ontic stubbornness, however, is hardly sufficient to define the reserve of art, which is always a reservoir of resonances, rather than a mystifying void. Modern theories attempting to distinguish between the being and meaning of art, a poem must not mean but be, are trapped into too empty an understanding of art's reserve. They reduce art to objects that cry, I am dark, but beautiful. Such thoughts bear, however, on the structure of all interpretation, rather than specifically on historical kinds. To some extent, this is inevitable. History, as reflected in histories, is both a series of acts and a series of intentions, acts whose intention was falsified or at least modified. A later knowledge sees they were based on myths or imperfect assumptions. History writing, therefore, while inherently critical, is not inherently judgmental. It is judgmental only by the claim that human beings could act without blindness, without that which makes them finite enough to act. But this claim is not made when history is told by historians, by critics rather than gods. Men act by overlooking certain possibilities or delimiting speculation, so that history appears as an illuminating progress of errors. Though we may differ over the cause of the blindness which precipitates men into action or maintains them in it, central error of this kind lies in the nature of action, whether or not described as historical. Interpretation, which makes that error appear, or gives it its dignity, is always historical to this extent. 
A systematic view of the problem would have to consider our greatest philosophers of existential error, Nietzsche and Heidegger. I will content myself with an eloquence of Emerson's. Emerson, seeing error of this kind as basic to the crystallization of passion or to symbol-making generally, places it under the mystery of form. Love and all the passions concentrate all existence around a single form. It is the habit of certain minds to give us an all-excluding fullness to the object, the thought, the word they alight upon, and to make that for the time the deputy of the world. These are the artists, the orators, the leaders of society. The power to detach and to magnify by detaching is the essence of rhetoric in the hands of the orator and the poet. This rhetoric, or power to fix the momentary eminency of an object, depends on the depth of the artist's insight of that object he contemplates. For every object has its roots in central nature, and may of course be so exhibited to us as to represent the world. Presently we pass to some other object, which rounds itself into a whole, as did the first. From the succession of excellent objects, learn we at last the immensity of the world, the opulence of human nature. Perhaps Nietzsche is, after all, the proper antidote to this astonishing optimism. Yet it is true that we constantly seek to master the accidents of life, to roll up our fortunes into a bowl, to find religious, artistic, or technological means of self-concentration. By such fatal centering we become conscious, then overconscious, then flee what is desired. History is, as it were, the wake of a mobile mind falling in and out of love with things it attaches, by its attachment. Its centering and decentering path leaves a chaos of forms behind. By negative transcendence it produces something as deep as a tragedy or as opulent as Emerson's view of nature. An updated, more realistic Emerson would have to acknowledge a new stage, with men increasingly divided into two camps. A nihilistic period has begun in which one camp wishes to live without reserve, without raw models, or squandering them as a rich son his inheritance while the other, fearing a debilitating loss of binding forms, deliberately espouses the crudest social myths. There is no mystery of form when forms lose their representativeness or mediating virtue. When men, distorting rather than exploring art's common wealth, its link with an interpretable fund of roles, fall back on narrow concepts of manliness and reenact those tragedies of revenge which society was founded to control. Greatness without models? Inconceivable. One could not be the thing itself. Reality. Make peace, therefore, with intermediacy and representation. Saul Bellow, Mr. Samler's Planet. Is it too late, or can our age, like every previous one, protect the concept of art? Part 2. The Reserve of Art and the Social Reserve. Art history presupposes that creation comes out of a chaos of forms rather than simply out of chaos, or miraculously, out of nothing. This chaos, with which the historical consciousness begins, has had many depictions, from the rabbinical pardes and that reservoir of perplexing images Yeats associated with the secrets of an anima mundi, to Ducher's Melancholia I, the wasteland's heap of broken images, and David Jones's Anathemata. When institutionalized, this chaos becomes a thesaurus or museum and expands with the historical consciousness. Hegel's observation that the Roman pantheon relativized the gods it brought together anticipates Malraux's universal musée imaginaire in which the gods are pictures. Were that museum, however, truly imaginary or without walls, it would mean the end of art as we know it. A secular sparagmos would carry art into the kingdom of nature and destroy its separated and contrasted existence. Our chaos of forms would move, in other words, from a beginning to an end position, one characterized by Hegel as a revel of forms, the sober bacchanalia of the human spirit reconciled with all its incarnations. That revel might be compared to the formal dance which ends certain comedies, except that it erases rather than affirms the art-reality distinction. The reconciliation is to be real, not formal. 
What lies between the chaos and the revel of forms? Conventions are institutions which are familiar and sometimes too familiar. There exists a highly structured reserve of forms which claims to represent for each generation the genius of a nation, class, or culture. Here are found the official commonplaces, the symbols and passwords that bind a community together or identify members to each other. It may be that the artist at present is tempted to pass from the chaos to the revel of forms without respecting this more structured realm. But since he cannot avoid it entirely, he violates its reserve by various kinds of self-exhausting parody, as in Woodstock's Feast of Tongues. The image of society resulting from a century of progress in social anthropology may help to clarify these concepts. Society is built up of tribes, communities, and special interests. To bind them together needs places, myths, and heroes in common. The idea of a commonplace is more concrete here than in the history of ideas or topoi. There is first an official, highly organized mythology, a state religion, for example, but underlying it, or not quite reducible, a pervasive, unofficial ideology or complex of beliefs. The difference between written and oral culture connects with this division. The latter shows, in any case, that what we have called the reserve is not totally rigid, but contains two systems of expression more or less conscious of each other, Sometimes, no doubt, the one will not know what the other is doing, but a strong relationship is necessary if the higher language is to retain its resonance and be more than superstructure. In addition to the reserve, we find an area which corresponds quite closely to the chaos of forms. Van Gennep saw that there was a phase of aggregation rituals, rit de passage, in which the candidate is betwixt and between, and which allows him a degree of self-determination in the choice of a social identity. During this liminal or marginal phase, the candidate is segregated and exposed to spirit powers directly, without forms or mediations available to men in society. He discovers in this way both his individuality and his isolation, both selfhood and the meaning of society. If we reflect that marginality is dangerous, not because it is empty, but because the absence of conventional social structuring allows room for an eruption of energies society is not integrated, then we see how similar this state is to the chaos of forms, which art explores. The artist is surely the liminal or threshold person par excellence, while art provides society with a chaos of roles, strengthening the individual sense of unstructured community, yet offering him ideal parts to try. Only the concept of liminality, moreover, as developed by Turner from Van Gennep, explains why art is statusless despite its civilizing role. Art is not reality. The relation of the one to the other is essentially liminal. Between art and its translation into immediate relevance, a threshold intervenes which cannot be crossed without destroying art's very place in society. The modern university is characterized by a similar kind of marginality, one basic to the development of man as a citizen, yet an individual. The liminal state is not restricted to puberty rites. It plays a significant role in initiations generally. Here is where the patience, negative capability, of the candidate may be tested, where symbolic sites and acts reverse his status or question his integrity. The mature man, after all, may need more restructuring than the ephebe, or his responsibilities may be heavier. He is therefore disoriented, disaggregated, under test conditions imposed by the group, before being accepted in, aggregated, once more. An artist, of course, is a group of one and has little or no ritual authority, yet art does submit us to a ritual and controlled experience of this kind. We are not compelled to participate in it, yet there are those who abide its question. It is no mean test to view what Aristotle calls a sense of pathos without being traumatized by it or distancing it into symbolic meaning, to let oneself be confronted by an ambiguity that, when it occurs in real life, splits the soul. The ritual process leads, of course, beyond liminality. A new identity, or re-identification, should emerge. This is not so clear in art, because art extends the liminal moment. 
There the identity quest is a formal device, and always something of a deception. In fact, whereas in the primitive rite there is probably no such thing as failing the process of aggregation, except for special cases in which the king must die, in art there is no such thing as fully succeeding in it. Art interests us less in the outcome of an ethical or vocational crisis than in the passion that attends, and the vision from passion. The hero, by suffering the chaos of forms, by descending into that Hades, glimpses the point where all human forms are identified. William Blake, Jerusalem. A redeemed city emerges from an ancestral chaos, yet to bring the vision back is greater than to attain it. The return, which corresponds socially to re-aggregation and psychologically to reintegration, is the moment of art itself, the opus. Facilis dissensus averno, sed revocare gradum superasque, evadere ad oras, hoc opus hic labor est. Goethe's Faust is an exceptionally clear instance of the work of art conceived as a socializing rite de passage, it shows, at the same time, the danger of confusing art with the production of new identities or role models. Faust moves from a spiritual acedia reflecting the burden of culture to the illusory revel of the Walpurgisnacht, and the more sophisticated dream of a reconciliation between those mighty cultural opposites, classic and Gothic, Greece and Germany. When the quest collapses and Faust adopts the pragmatic role of bridge builder, Goethe's myriad minded play is unmasked as a ponderous ritual en bourgeoisement. We have entered the era of the well made rite of passage. But how else can we emerge from the chaos of forms? What can art create if not a reconciling social myth or an ideal personal role? Is art's truth merely in its obsessive consumption or negative transcendence of historical models? We recall the contemporary situation. While primitive ritual makes room for the living by ceremonies that both propitiate and separate the dead, the dead, if not separated from the living, bring badness on them. The growth of the historical sense makes clean ritual separations difficult. If the dead are less dangerous when viewed as historically transcended or sublimated forces, they are also more insinuating. They do not fall easily into pure and impure, malevolent and beneficent, tribal and alien. The time spent in the marginal state, the submission to visions of the night, lengthens. We feel more strongly than ever that the past pollutes and that it saves. Nothing human alienates me, for the historical consciousness, exotic or irrational, are simply estranged potentialities of the human spirit. All human forms are identified in Blake's redeemed city. In these circumstances, art both accepts and rejects more. It resists the spirits it calls up and absorbs conflicting traditions by a movement more eccentric than Miltonic similes. The new myth that kills the old the new form that separates what is dead from what is living has the value of a purification rather than of truth. The chaos of form aspires to become a revel. In the sublimities of a Milton, Blake or Shelley, there is a high laughter as well as a high seriousness. There remains, of course, the shadow of the false or premature revel, promiscuous acceptance, as in the Walpurgisnacht of the chaos of forms, or such fickle at one as Blake places into Beula. The unitive vision of art is not a spiritual cannibalism or triumph of death. Consider Goethe once more. His Faust enters the chaos of the past, but rejects its abstract promises. He wants participation, mastery, universality, yet Faust's progress in that direction gives renewed birth to sacrificial abstractions. The more universal his vision, the more blatant his disregard of parochial dignities and individual suffering. And Goethe, too, pays a price in his art for a clarity superior to that of contemporaries like Holderlin and Blake. He stylizes the dynamic character of the vast cultural reserve embodied in his poems. The conflict of classes and tongues becomes matter 
for a virtuoso display. Art has now acquired its own reserve, a backlog of forms which Goethe applies perfectly, mixing types of verse and transcending national boundaries through a deployment of inherited topoi. This art reserve has advantages over both the chaos of forms and the social reserve. It is better organized than the first, and broader than the second. Its disadvantage, however, is that, charted still further by humanists like Northrop Frye, it could substitute itself for the ritual process. Then art becomes a technique, and culture grammar, rather than a genuine mediation. A wrestling with, a separating of, the dead. 3. Afterthought In the 1930s, Ernst Robert Curtius began the studies that led to European Literature and the Latin Middle Ages, 1948. For that work, Goethe was the central man. Through his art, the great body of formal and formative commonplaces elaborated since Homer are said to have reached the threshold of modern German literature. Through him, they were saved from becoming a dead language. At our distance from the 1930s, which saw a parallel, though less literary, development in America, A.O. Lovejoy's great chain of being also concerned with continuity. This type of literary history seems faulty. It tends to be a courtesy book for scholars, an exercise in the urbane diffusion of knowledge. Histories of topical ideas, literary or philosophical, remain in the domain of memoria technica, rather than serving the living, ancestor-haunted consciousness. History should tell us what made a person or a group historical, what marked them and passed into mind with the force of the biblical injunction, remember, thou shalt not forget. Or what helped them learn to forget, to remit the burden of the past. This individuating and often delimiting cycle disappears from histories of Topoi. The humanistic kind of monism sees little that is new under the sun. Yet scholarship has its own historical context and we easily overlook the call it answered. Faulty or not, Curtius's great commonplace book is the protest of Nemesine against Germania. It enlarged the memory of a nation when political pressures had reduced art to a narrow, racialist canon. Curtius appealed to memory not for the sake of the past, but for the sake of Romania, which he viewed as more than a country of the mind. It was a wronged spirit, a genius loci expelled from Germania by fascism. Like Blake, therefore, but in a darker time, he engaged in mental fight to restore his country's genius to its memorable form. <laughs>